Red Baron's new fully loaded hand tossed style pizza is so full of topping. Hold on there, partner. That there pizza is big enough for the both of us. With a half pound of toppings and a soft, chewy crust, it sure is. Problem is, though, this town ain't. <gasps> Introducing the Red Baron fully loaded hand tossed style pizza. Share something awesome. Sweat, lift, sprint, and more in the all new Reebok Nano X4 training shoe. As the official shoe of fitness, the redesigned Nano X4 is one of the most breathable, lightweight, and stable iterations of the award winning Nano yet. Basically, everything you like about a training shoe improved, everything you didn't removed. The Reebok Nano X4, available now. Visit Reebok.com to learn more. Building a portfolio with Fidelity Basket Portfolios is kind of like making a sandwich. It's as simple as picking your stocks and ETFs, sort of like your meats and other topics, and managing it as one big, juicy investment. Mmm, now that's pretty good. Learn more at fidelity.com slash baskets. Investing involves risk, including risk of loss. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC. Member NYSC SIPC. Shaq here, spinning fast-acting pain relief for 2024 with Icy Hot. Take it from me, sticking to your new workout routines can lead to sore muscles. Icy Hot starts working instantly to dull the pain with the icy cool sensation. Then, the warming sensation relaxes it away. Feel the power of Icy Hot's contrast therapy. Ice works fast. Heat makes it last. Icy Hot. Hello, Duke fans, and welcome to DBR Bites, episode 18, actual DBR Bites, episode 18, not the fake DBR Bites, episode 18. That was fake news yesterday when we did that. It was actually Duke Basketball Report podcast number 497. Today is DBR Bites, episode 18. I am your host for this episode. I am Sam Klein. I'm joined, as always, by Jason Evans and Donald Wine. Donald, what's up, man? Uh, I'm glad that we're actually going to do DVR bites 18 this time around and that we actually are going to, it's going to be a bite. We're not going to cook a full meal like we did yesterday. We're keeping it tight, right? Jason Evans. We are. And and folks should know, by the way, that yesterday, one of the reasons that the three of us were like flipping out at how long the episode was, was there was about 15 minutes of just bizarre, weird side conversation that we had that got excised out. I don't think anyone would be able to listen to it and tolerate it. But it felt like we were on for a long, long time because there was a lot of that didn't make the air. Yeah, we uh, we discussed uh, we discussed what it means to be a podcast bro. I yes, believe. It, it was and, way too long a conversation. <laughs> and uh, anyway, if you if you read that New York Times editorial about podcast bros, let us know. DBR podcast at Gmail dot com. Soothe us and tell us that we are not. Hey, we can we guys. can do it really fast. We we came to the conclusion we are not podcast bros, but but we're kind. Podcast of. bros would lack the self awareness to recognize that they themselves are podcast right. bros. Right. So it is a. I just said all hardly no. It is a riddle. I I said we're not having this conversation. It is a riddle. I said it yesterday. I'm saying it today. <laughs> then let's not have the conversation. Let's talk about the ACC tournament, a tournament that, as of right now, we're recording at 5:45 p.m. On Tuesday, the 7th of March, uh, the ACC tournament is underway and most relevant to uh, Duke fans is that Georgia Tech beat Florida State this afternoon in a game that I did not watch, but I can only imagine was a barn burner. 61 to 60 was the final score. uh, And that means that Georgia Tech now faces Pitt tomorrow for the right to play Duke on Thursday afternoon uh, in where is this tournament being played at the Greensboro Coliseum at the old, the old home of the ACC tournament. 
Uh, most of the rest of the teams, certainly all the teams that you would expect to have any shot of winning this thing are still alive. There are games ongoing today, but we want to preview this ACC tournament, talk about some of the dynamics at play here. We can talk about sort of who's most likely to come out of it and what the implications might be for NCAA tournament seeding. Because while Duke is, at least I think we would say safely in the field, uh, Duke's seed in this NCAA tournament is very much still up in the air, as are uh, the placements of many of the other top teams in the ACC. So, Jason, uh, let's start with Duke's path here, and then maybe we can talk about the rest of of the conference. So, as I mentioned, Georgia Tech upsets Florida State. They will play Pitt tomorrow for the right to play Duke. If Duke moves on from there, uh, they face the winner of uh, Miami versus Syracuse or Wake Forest, uh, and that's Duke's path to the potential championship game where all of the other teams await on the other side. So tell us about Duke's path to the title game in this ACC tournament. So as you said, the winner of that Pittsburgh and uh, Georgia Tech game is the team that Duke will face in the quarterfinals. I, I, I like Duke's situation there. Uh, we've already seen that we, we just ran Georgia Tech off the floor. I don't get the, the impression that Georgia Tech is playing appreciably you know, like a lot better than they were earlier this season. Obviously, anything can happen anytime, but but I feel like uh, I, I'm not that worried about Georgia Tech. And I, I feel like Pitt, Pitt, Pitt's a little bit desperate. Pitt needs at least one victory, I think, to feel comfortable. And and they're going to, they've already beaten Georgia Tech twice this year. Frankly, neither of those games were all that close. Pitt won by 11 at Georgia Tech. Pitt then won by eight points at home. Um, not blowouts, but certainly games where Pittsburgh was clearly the better team. And I would expect Pitt to be the better team and and take out Georgia Tech. I kind of hope it's a close game, a competitive game. So Pitt, you know, is a little worn out, maybe not that rested when they when they face the the Blue Devils. Um, there's, you know, exactly 24 hours between those game time starts, 2.30 start on Wednesday, and then 2.30 for the game, the winner will play against the Blue Devils. So, you know. As much as they can be tired coming into the Duke game, I'll I'll let you take. I I feel like Pitt isn't. They're not playing their best ball right now. Uh, they lost the last two games of the season. Both of those were road games, but like they lost to Notre Dame, and that that's that's a bad loss. They played close with Miami, but it doesn't look to me like Pitt is you know peaking at this moment or anything like that. And I, I really like I really like Duke. In, in that game, I don't think Pitt is a team that's particularly well suited to handle Duke's size. Um, they've got Federico Federico. God, I love his name, uh, who who is a force on the inside. But, you know, the notion the notion that he's going to be able to battle the likes of Filipowski and Ryan Young and Derek Lively. I, I think I think Pitt just doesn't have the horses really to to play with Duke and Georgia Tech doesn't either. So I, I really like you know, Duke there. And, and, and from there, it's probably Miami. And that's a really tough game, a really tough game. And I don't know if we want to go that far in advance in, in looking ahead at stuff, but um, uh, you know, Miami's, Miami's got those guards and Miami just beat the absolute breaks off of us. And Sam, you're better qualified than anybody to talk about that because you were there. So. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do want to get Donald in here first though. Donald, uh, as you look at it, whether it's Pitt or Georgia tech, and then maybe even looking ahead at Miami, what do you think about Duke's side of the bracket? Yeah, well, I actually wanted to go back to on Sunday when we when Jason and I kind of recapped the game against UNC. Um, I, I I was remiss in, in pointing out that uh, I was hanging out with Matt Burr, our friend from WXDU Sports, after the game. So shout out to him. Uh, he, he and I had a, a beer after the game, but we were talking about what Duke has gone through over the last three weeks to kind of feel like we can be confident entering this ACC tournament. And the real thing is we've been through just about every kind of scenario there is. We've had close games. We've had blowout games. We've had games where we've had to hold a lead and and withstand an onslaught of threes. We've had games where we didn't shoot well. We've had games where we shot well. We've had games where we've had to win with defense and free throws. We've had games where we won running away. So the fact of the matter is, is this team is prepared for just about anything that could happen in this ACC tournament. And when we look at what we did against Pitt the first time, this was a game where we didn't shoot well, but we made we went to the free throw line and we made free throws. And I think when it comes to Duke, I think at the end of the day, we need to see a Duke come out with energy, right? There's a lot of things that are keys, right? 
not having turnovers, playing with energy, shooting the ball well, making free throws, playing good defense. But all of this comes back to do just playing their game. And I think the one Achilles heel in the, in the terms of the scheduling that we had to overcome in the last three weeks was that back-to-back, that Saturday, Monday back-to-back. If you recall the first two, we didn't do quite so well in the second game, but we did well in the first game. And then it turned out in the third Sunday, Saturday, Monday back-to-back, we ended up performing well and we won both games. This is going to be a time where there's a couple of questions, right? This is the first year that John Shire is coaching in the ACC tournament. I want to see what he does with his bench. I want to see if he utilizes the bench of these games. Do we see Jalen Blakes, who we haven't seen a lot of lately? Do we see even a Jaden Shoot come off the bench and, and get some playing time, especially if we are running away? Because again, we've had these games where we have been up by a lot late and then teams have caught up on us and forced us to kind of keep our starters in the game. Do we have a scenario where he gets to utilize those guys? And especially if we're going to play, you know, we have to win three games in three days to win the ACC tournament. Do we see that kind of rotation build up a little bit, or does he rely on the eight guys really that he's been playing with the last three weeks? You know, Donald, to the point about the quick turnaround, I like, you know, in hindsight, that Duke has gotten the opportunity to play some of these quick turnaround matches because it, it does prepare them better for this ACC tournament. And I also want to remind folks, let, let's take you all the way back to November, the one other time that Duke has had to play a back-to-back. The one time when you simulate the back-to-back during the regular season is during those Thanksgiving tournaments. And uh, now, one of Duke's uh, most lopsided performances this year came at the end of that tournament against a Purdue team that at the time we were like, you know, Purdue seems pretty good. Maybe they're better than than we had given them credit for. And lo and behold, like Pitt is is vying for a number one seed. Um, they're like a number two, probably at worst here at the end of the season. But I want to take you back to the second game of that tournament. So in the first game of that tournament, Duke beats Oregon State in a pretty underwhelming performance. It was a three-point victory. Oregon State was able to hold Duke down uh, in a lot of ways. Duke came back the next day and had a had a pretty nice victory against a Xavier team that, somewhat similar to Purdue, I think we collectively underrated at the time. I think we said going into that game, you know, Xavier's pretty good. Like this will be a this will be a nice test for Duke and and this. It's arguably our best win of the season. It probably is our best win of the season. So the, I, I, this is what I was going to say is that is that uh, in lieu of uh, the F, the refs considering the matter closed, uh, <laughs> that Xavier win in hindsight is Duke's best victory this year, and Duke did it on on the one day turnaround. So uh, whatever John Shire can do to muster the energy from that, you got to love that. Hopefully. You know, if Duke takes care of business against Pitt or Georgia Tech tomorrow, that they turn around and do the same thing against Miami. You know, it's worth noting that our half of the draw has a little more time between the quarterfinals and the semifinals than the other half of the draw. That, you know, uh, uh, us and Miami and whoever Miami faces play the early afternoon games on Thursday. And then Friday is an evening game. 7 p.m. would be the start time. Uh, and then Saturday, if we're in the championship, it's an eight thirty p.m. start. But I, I, I kind of like our, I like us having a little more time than than the other half of the draw, where those teams are playing. You know, like the Virginia, Clemson, NC State, North Carolina, and such. They're playing an evening game, and then they follow up with another evening game. Then they follow up with another evening game. So look, it's only probably a matter of four hours, five hours, or something like that. But all of it makes a little bit of a difference in terms of your recovery time. And and on that side of the bracket, maybe guys, we can we can talk about it just briefly because lots of of permutations here. Uh, assuming that Duke is able to get through their first two games, which is uh, which is of course no guarantee. On the other side, there as you said, Jason, the teams that await uh, in order of of their ranking, Virginia is the best team, uh, sort of on that side of the bracket. Clemson's the number three seed, although. Uh, if you're if you're keeping up with the bracketology, Clemson is not guaranteed anything at this point in terms of uh, NCAA tournament appearance and seeding. So Clemson is 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 in the double bye, but they are waiting around for uh, likely NC State, who uh, would face them in that uh, in that quarterfinal game. And then UNC is the team that that would rise up to 
to play Virginia, assuming that UNC gets through the winner of the Boston College and Louisville uh, match that is going on right now. So, Jason, give me give me any of your thoughts about the other side of the bracket and, and maybe who you expect to see uh, coming from the bottom half of the ACC in the championship game. Yeah, it's tough. I, I If you ask me to pick a team, I'm going to pick NC State there. I, I know that they they arguably have – they probably have the hardest road because um, I think they're probably going to get Virginia Tech, who I think is um, certainly the best of those teams – that are playing sort of in the first round. And and then they get a Clemson team that I think uh, NC State's better than Clemson. Um, and then they'll have likely Virginia and then they have the championship game. But I, I think NC State, from what I've seen in terms of how they're playing right now lately and and the quality of the roster, I, I, I think NC State's probably the team that comes out of the bottom of that draw. I'm glad we're not facing them. Uh, NC State and Miami to me are the two teams that I really, really don't want to play. And I told you that uh, Clemson is in a way fighting for their lives right now. Give me, I, I want both of you to, to give me your thoughts on sort of ACC teams looking ahead to the NCAA tournament and what kind of performances they need to turn in to, you know, to, to reach at least getting to the tournament. Jason, I'll, I'll send it back to you first. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious. Most people would say that Miami and Duke and Virginia are, are locks that they're in. They could even, they could lose their first games, probably even lose those games um, embarrassingly, and they would still make the NCAA tournament. That's that's really not up for question. So then we get to the teams that need to do some work. I think NC State and Pitt probably just need to win their second round game. You know, in the case of Pitt, they just need to beat Georgia Tech. NC State just needs to beat that Virginia Tech Notre Dame um, winner. Clemson probably needs to beat NC state. I think if Clemson loses to NC state or if Virginia tech or Notre Dame make it through there, I, I think Clemson doesn't advance. And there's maybe some argument that Clemson needs to win two games. North Carolina is in the same boat as Clemson. They need to win at least two games. I think um, if not make the, the championship game. And uh, I, you know, I, I don't know that anybody else has a chance. I, I can't imagine that Syracuse or Wake Forest have a chance of making it unless they win the ACC championship. So the 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 short answer is, you know, again, I'd say NC State and Pitt win one game, Clemson win two games, which means make it to the ACC championship, and North Carolina is in the same boat as Clemson. They got to win three games for Carolina to make it to the uh, the ACC championship to have a chance. I think when it comes to Clemson, I think they do need to win two games because if they face an NC State. I feel like in the eyes of the committee, that won't be enough for Clemson to get in on, on just by beating that team. I think they would need another one because when you look at it, even though, you know, NC state is probably has the better resume when it comes to the committee, to the NCAA committee, you, when you look at it, it's still three versus seven and three is supposed to beat seven in the ACC tournament. And so they won't look at that and say, Oh, we're going to give Clemson any extra points for that. So um, I, I think just looking at that, I think that's where they need. Donald, I, I just wait, wait. I disagree. Uh, first of all, like I, I agree with you that Clemson needs to win a couple games, but I think that if Clemson beats NC State, it enhances their resume. It, you know, I agree because, that it enhances their resume, and I actually think that State's going to be favored in that game if it happens. They will be. I, problem I is possibly. Yeah. The problem is that uh, I don't know that NC State. Like right now, NC State, I guess NC State would, would represent a quad one opportunity for Clemson. Um, they're currently ranked 40th in the net and in neutral site games. Yeah. You got to be top 50 for that. I don't top think 50, NC yeah. State is dipping below that uh, in in the course of, of winning one game. Some, somehow I doubt they're going to drop 10 spots in the net in that time. So that does represent a quad one opportunity for Clemson. And that's really the main way that the committee is thinking about it. Although, I agree with Jason. I think that that NC State's going to be favored in that game. Uh, The metrics all say that NC State is better than Clemson. Why is it that with sparkling water, I'm always playing guessing games with what flavor I'm drinking? Is it citrus? Is it aluminum can flavored? Mm, Not sure. Sparkling ice, though, they really mean flavor. Like in-your-face flavor. Orange mango, black raspberry. Don't even get me started on the strawberry lemonade. Kiwi Strawberry slid right into my taste buds DMs last night and let them know who's boss. No subtleties there and no sugar either. But it does have vitamins and antioxidants. Find sparkling ice at a major grocery store or club retailer near you. Sparkling ice. Anything but subtle. Whether you're a diehard sports fan 
a hopeless romantic, or a comedy aficionado. The Xfinity 10G network was made for streaming it all. Worry less about buffering when streaming your favorite shows, movies, or live sports, and enjoy a better way to watch. Xfinity gives you a reliable connection for streaming, plus all the entertainment you love all in one place. Fear not, because now you can finally sit back, relax, and stream your favorite entertainment and sports like never before with the Xfinity 10G network. Yeah. You know you need protein to fuel results, but it's not easy when you're drinking the same bland chalky shake every day. Stop punishing yourself and get to GNC for the best protein in the game, including all the hottest brands and crave-worthy flavors that'll keep you coming back for more. We're talking protein that legit tastes like cookies, your favorite cereals, indulgent desserts, and more. So bust out of your protein rut and actually look forward to those shakes with unbeatable protein at unbeatable prices. Fuel your fitness with protein at GNC. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust or is it <clears throat> a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. I will say when it comes to NC State, right, like, a lot of teams are picking them as kind of the Cinderella team, or at least the Cinderella pick of the ACC tournament. The fact is that, you know, with J- with Jarkel Joyner and uh, Turquavion Smith, if they're hitting their threes, then they're a tough out. We've seen that, right? We we see, we got the doors blown off of us in Raleigh. It, it took them, they, they almost caught up with us in the final minute of the game a, a week ago where <laughs> they, it feels like they hit eight threes in the course of a minute and a half to, to catch up in that game. But, I think when it comes to those two, that is their only their only drawback is if those guys get cold at a certain point, they might be in trouble. And, and I think that's where they have to show kind of the committee that hey, this team is good. We can get to the NCAA tournament. We can pick off a couple teams in the NCAA tournament, and we don't need we we don't we can rely on more than just shooting to get us there. And I think that's where like a DJ Burns, the emergence of him would help if he has a good tournament. That will help again you know, kind of look and say, hey, they have more than just these two guys uh, as scoring options. They have an inside presence and they can be a tough out for anyone in the NCAA tournament. But I do think that they have a chance to get to the final in this NCAA tournament. They they have the tools and they have the guys. And honestly, they're playing good enough basketball right now. And if they add the desperation to it, then that that's basically a combination that says, hey, they can go far if they want it. Donald, who's winning the ACC tournament? Duke. And that's not a homer pick. Jason, who's wi- <laughs> Jason, who's winning the ACC tournament? So I'll, I'll tell you it's Duke, and I'll also tell you that Ken Pomeroy has run his computer, and his computer says there's a 23.4% chance that the Duke Blue Devils win the ACC tournament. They have the best odds of anybody. Pomeroy's computer gives Duke 23.4%, Miami 18.4%, Virginia 157 and then North Carolina at 12%. Clemson's at nine, NC State's at eight. Look, as high as we are on NC State, the computer says they only have an eight and a half chance, eight and a half percent chance of winning the uh, ACC tournament. The computer really likes whoever wins that Duke Miami game to to win the win the whole thing in the ACC. But I, I agree, Duke's playing the best of anybody in the tournament uh, coming into the tournament, and uh, I, I feel like, especially with a young team that looks like they've matured a lot and are figuring things out. And with Derek Lively anchoring what may be the best defense in the ACC right now, I don't even know why I said maybe. I think it's almost certainly the best defense in the ACC. Virginia fans would probably be upset about that, but I would argue with them on it. Uh, I, I feel like this Duke team has a really, really great chance to cut down the nets. I I, I guess I'll pick Duke, but but I, I just want to note that I am uh, very much anticipating the potential Duke-Miami matchup. I think that uh, it'll be it'll be good for Duke uh, in their fields to have a competitive game against Miami after the shellacking that they took uh, down in Coral Gables a few weeks look, ago. Look, I'll, I'll tell you, I said it earlier, I just want to reiterate it. That's the that's the team I fear the most in the ACC. I think my not just that Miami is the one seed, just in terms of their makeup, I, I feel like they are the team that has the tools that can allow them to beat Duke better than anybody else in the conference. I agree. By the way, Jason, uh, Ken Pomeroy says that Duke does have the best defense in the conference right now. Not high enough that I'm going to win that category in the stat game, but uh, Duke has the 27th best adjusted defense in the country. Virginia is second 
at 34. Before we get out of here, Jason, I know you wanted to uh, talk about a couple of uh, a couple of other topics. The first, let, let's stick with basketball real quick. Uh, John Shire was announced as a finalist for the Joe B. Hall Award. This is the award given to the best first year head coach in uh, Division One men's basketball. I see a couple other interesting names on this list, but Jason, you told me before we started that you do not think that John Shire is going to win this award. Why is that? So I was looking when when the, it was announced that Shire was a finalist for the Joe B. Hall Award. I looked down the list of all the guys on it, and I was like, oh, man, he's going to win this for sure. And and I started, you know, sort of looking at those different teams. Uh, it's like a guy from Fairleigh Dickinson, George Washington, Weber State. And I was like, oh, Shire's definitely, you know, it, Duke is so much better than those teams. And then I got to Jerome Tang at Kansas State. Kansas State has been a continual Big 12 doormat over the years. This is a team that has not been, that you know, routinely, they are the worst team in the Big 12. They're top 20 in Ken Palm. They're 23 and eight on the season playing in the Big 12. They are absolutely a team that people, if you tell someone, hey, I'm, I'm picking them to make the Elite Eight or the Final Four, people won't think you're crazy. Jerome Tang at Kansas State, I think, the fact that he's in his first year is just super impressive what he's done there at K-State. And then the other guy who I think will be a big contender along with John Shire, Keith Ergo at Fordham. You know, Fordham is 24 and seven this year. They're a major contender in the Atlantic 10. I'm not saying they're like a top 50 team or anything like that. They're not even a top 100 team. But the fact that Fordham went 24 and seven is impressive. Do you know the last time a Fordham team was above 500? It was 2007. So hat tip to Keith Ergo, hat tip to Jerome Chang. To, I'm sorry, Tang. I think John Shire's done an incredible job this year. I think those two guys probably finish ahead of him, though, in the Joby Hall Award race. And then one other note, uh, Jason, tell us about Daniel Jones's new contract. $160 million. Daniel sorry, Jones could, you, is, could, could you repeat that? Yeah. Uh, do I need to repeat it? It's $160 million. That's a one, a six, and a zero, and then a whole bunch of zeros after that. <laughs> Daniel Jones signs a four-year deal with the New York Giants. It also includes $35 million in incentives. With any pro football contract, you always wonder how much is guaranteed because teams will frequently rip up these contracts if they don't like them. He has $82 million guaranteed. Uh, that's that's just a lot, lot, lot of money. And congrats to Daniel Jones. He He deserves it after having a great year in New York. Last year, they could have extended his contract and only paid him like $25 million for this year or something like that. Instead, they're paying him $40 million. They're paying him $160 million over the next four years. Daniel Jones, way to go, my friend. Yeah, and when he – today is the day that you know they have to make decisions on who they're going to franchise tag. NFL teams uh, have been negotiating with people. You, you've probably seen the – the uh, stuff around Lamar Jackson's uh, free agency and his contract negotiations with Baltimore. But when it came to uh, New York Giants, they had Daniel Jones and they had Saquon Barkley, who they both uh, both are out of contract. The Giants want to bring both of them back to do so. The first thing they did was to negotiate and get this deal done with Daniel Jones, because that's how important he is to this franchise uh, and how important he has become over the last year. They also, because of that, were able to franchise tag Saquon Barkley. So both of them will be coming back next year. And this is exactly what the Giants wanted. It's a win-win situation uh, for them. They get uh, their quarterback for the next four years and Daniel Jones gets his dough, uh, which he, which he so desperately deserved. I want to be at David Cutcliffe's house when it's Christmas time to see the Christmas present he gets from Daniel Jones this year. <laughs> so I, I was on that note. I, I just want to say Daniel Jones, because I know Daniel Jones has been on the show uh, year, a couple years ago when he was still at Duke. Uh, he has been on this podcast before. And as his favorite podcasts, I feel like he should give us all, you know, $25. Like I, I, I'm not asking for a whole thing. I feel like, like we played a part, you know? Yeah. We did that. We we helped with that. So what are, what are we worth? Like half wait, a percent wait. of his success? Like a round wait, of drinks. That's what we're talking hold about. Hold on. He just he making one sixty million, and you're asking for twenty five bucks, Donald. <laughs> you don't ask. You don't ask someone for one hundred six fifty nine million dollars. You ask him for twenty five. Then next time you ask for fifty, then seventy five, and then one day that's when you get the big dough. That's when you ask for the big cash. You you got to work your way up. Donald is just, a financial Donald secret. Is a, Financial secrets from Donald Wine. <laughs> Donald is a, is a strange friend. 
All right. <laughs> I think that's it. Congratulations to Daniel Jones. Uh, congratulations to John Shire for being a finalist for an award that he definitely should be a, a finalist for. Uh, uh, so that is great. Um, if he beats out Tang and Ergo, Jason, I will be stunned. But um, <laughs> yeah, li- like like you. But but we'll see what happens. We'll be back uh, at the very least after Duke's game on Thursday. Um, we won't tell you who they're going to play because we're not going <laughs> to record before that. I don't think they, um, they better look. They better play Pitt because if they don't play Pitt, the ACC is losing the bid, and I don't want to see uh, the come. Although, Sam, you don't care about the conference. So I don't care. No, famously, uh, I don't care. Uh, uh, <laughs> on the one hand, I want Duke to play Miami because I want Duke to have the opportunity to get another like major victory. Um, but I would yeah, rather Duke win the yeah. and, and play all double-digit seats. Uh, that's, yeah. the, that's, that's the best outcome for me. No shame. So, There's no shame. In, or you, still, n- none. you still get to cut down the nets. You still get to have a banner if you beat all Nobody double-digit cares. seats. Nobody cares. Yeah. Nobody cares. Yep. Turns out. Uh, so, for Jason Evans, for Donald Wine, I'm Stan Klein. Sam Klein. I think I'm Sam Klein. Stay in touch with us, dbrpodcast at gmail.com. We'll talk to you again after that game on Thursday. This has been DBR Bites, episode 18. 18. And this is the Duke Band to play us out and take us home.